This is a CBC Podcast. Hey, I'm Michelle Parisi, the woman behind Alone, a love story. Season three is coming out on February 5th. Love, sex, travel, motherhood, it's all in there. You don't expect anything less from me by now, do you? So put on some tea, make some space under the blankets, and get ready to hunker down with the final season of Alone, a Love Story. Dante, Anine, Buju, hello and welcome. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. We use technology every day in all kinds of ways, from our smartphones and apps for that to computer programs and virtual reality gaming. But did you know that technology is also being used to create traditional practices like beadwork and indigenous knowledge like cedar basket weaving is being used to teach algorithms? Today on Radio Indigenous, we explore the intersection where technology meets tradition. Many indigenous communities are sharing language through technology. Facebook groups and word-of-the-day tweets can help with learning language, but more and more apps that help people translate and learn new words and phrases are popping up, like this one. That means, what are you eating in Ojibwe or Anishinaabe Moan? It's one of the many common phrases that can be found on a new app called Kobe Learn. It was created by the Kuwaitnuk Ogimakinak Board of Education to help young users learn common words and phrases in Ojibwe, Cree, and Oji Cree. When you choose a phrase, a voice will read it like the one we heard, but the app also shows a picture of the phrase and the corresponding syllabics. The board hopes it will help carry traditional languages into the future. To do that, the creators made sure to include contemporary phrases too. That means, can you text me? Sarah Johnson is the native language lead with the KO Board of Education. Here she is explaining the community effort to get the app off the ground. I have native language teachers from our five communities working on them, including um, parents um, and elders. And we also consulted, you know, local people to um, come up with like translation, um, interpreting words that are not commonly used, especially technology words. It took some discussion and uh, agreeing to what proper phrase to use. Sarah Johnson says the KO Board of Education was very clear in who this app would appeal to. This is for our 21st century learners mostly for our students. We made it so it's compatible in um, Android devices as well, as well as in, you know, iPhones, and especially in Chromebooks. A lot of our students use Chromebooks in classrooms, so it is um, compatible to download that app in the Chromebook. So, so it is usable in the classroom. When the app was released, news of it spread quickly on social media. Everyone was just so excited, you know, in hearing the voices of our people, the local people, and seeing um, familiar faces on the app. Sarah Johnson is the native language lead with the Kuwaitnuk Ogimakinak Board of Education in northwestern Ontario. The new app is available now. It's called Kobe Learn, and it's available for Ojibwe, Cree, and Oji Cree. Thanks to the CBC and Thunder Bay for sharing that story. Now it's time to try this app out. So when you open the app, it takes you to a page where you have four options. Language, culture notes, search, and credits. Let's push language and see what's under here. You've got 31 categories you can choose from, including food and beverages, food phrases, eating food, animals, body parts, that kind of thing. Office phrases. My kids tell me I am the slowest typer in the universe. Make some coffee. and Well, that's a that's a mouthful. I'm going to learn that one. 
If you want to uh, learn some Cree or OG Cree or Ojibwe and play around with phrases, you can download Kobe Learn from your favorite app store. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Examining the intersection between tradition and technology on the show today, you might think that you need a computer or a smartphone to send a social media message. But educator Noelle Pepin is communicating through bracelets. She's using the First Nations practice of loom beading to teach her students digital coding language. The CBC's Nicole Out has more. Binary code is a digital language used to create and communicate on the Internet. It uses strings of zeros and ones to represent letters, numbers, and commands. And it's a skill teacher Noelle Pepin was teaching to her students. So in no way do I think I am an expert in computer language. <laughs> I was just a learner as well. But I was also learning how to loom bead. So binary language has eight bits of information. And then as I was beading, I was like, wait, I'm putting eight beads on this loop. So I kind of just had it click. Why can't we send a message through the bracelet? It was a true aha moment, as we say in education, where you're just like, these things fit. It makes sense. Combining the traditional and the digital. Noelle took the idea and got to work, creating her first binary computer language beaded bracelet. She chose to use red and black beads to represent her Nishka heritage. I asked a student for a quote about our school, and he said, Nastio is awesome, every kid should, should go here, it's beautiful, and then I put his initials at the end. But it fit exactly on the loom, so I was like, all right, this is meant to be, let's just keep this going. Traditional beadwork often consists of beautiful patterns. However, Noelle takes a very different approach when planning out what she calls a beaded tweet. So you do have the modern coding language where you're talking about, okay, what is your message you want to send? What's the purpose of that message? So when you look at a beaded tweet, you're kind of like, what happened there? Like the... Because <laughs> it isn't really up to making a visual striking pattern, like a chevron pattern or any other type of pattern that's kind of more balanced. The beaded tweet isn't balanced, but it's kind of interesting what you can see in your beaded tweet after. In recent years, the BC government has been redesigning the school curriculum. There is now an emphasis on integrating Indigenous culture and ways of knowing into all areas of teaching. For Noelle and her beaded tweet project, it's not just about kids learning a coding language. Also, just the teachings that come from the practice of beating, which are identity, trust, connection, focus, patience, discipline, perseverance, ownership, and sharing. So the students in my guide for this project work through all of these teachings and reflect on them. As a teacher, I kind of use metaphor a lot. Your first bracelet, you will probably drop a lot of beads is how it's said that's because you're not going through all of the beads at once so one of them will drop down and really the way I related that to teaching is that sometimes you might think that you're hitting a student and you're like all excited about this cool project that you just thought of but sometimes our kids need a little bit more support and some one-on-one -on -one support to get them into these engaging projects to get them that strong foundation. Noelle recently completed her master's and the Beaded Tweet project was at the center of her work. While she spent a lot of time thinking about beads and binary code in an educational context, Noelle says it also represents something very personal. I think it really ties me to who I am. I am like mixed ancestry, so my mom is Nishka and my dad is French-Italian. It's just that two worlds message, and I've always connected with one of the elders in the Nishka Nation said, success for our students would be to dance in both worlds. And I just want to try and create that for the future as well as represent that myself. You can find out more about the Beaded Tweets project on Twitter at Beaded Tweets, or you can find a link on our website, cbc.ca slash unreserved. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. John Corbett has taken the link between beating and technology to a whole other level. 
By embedding the tradition of his Métis heritage into the pixels of a digital portrait series called Four Generations. In this work, family portraits are generated using digital images of beads. As the beads appear and disappear in a spiral on the screen, faces of his family members advance and recede as the beading patterns shift. John is a professor at the University of British Columbia's Okanagan campus, and he joins me from our studio there. Welcome, John. Hi. So first off, why did you want to incorporate beading into your art practice? It comes from a long, long relationship I've had with the fragmentation of computer imagery, in particular uh, pixelation. And, you know, back in the 80s, um, when I was just a kid and learning how to use a computer program, computers, um, the scan lines of a computer monitor really fascinated me. And ever since then, I've been just enthralled with artwork that is made up or represented by fractured color components and stuff. So uh, the artwork of Ellsworth Kelly comes to mind and Chuck Close, how those images are represented with um, very small abstracted forms of uh, individual color units. And that's where that translation uh, kind of came across. So in my master's degree, uh, one of my advisors had said, you know, you have this really strong draw to this fragmented image or reconstructing images from these fragmented components. Um, have you ever considered that your own heritage beadwork is just uh, that same process? At that point is where it got me started into thinking, oh, my God, I can't believe I overlooked um, this obvious connection. Mm -hmm. And once you learned how to bead, you realized that it takes a long time, but you, <laughs> but you figured out a workaround. What was it? So, yeah, uh, I beaded to smaller portraits just as testing to test my skills and how hard it was to get my needle through the hide. And it was very labor intensive. And a lot of that was decision making process. So I was working from an image of portraits of my family and deciding what color bead, where to place it, how to make that pattern. You know, do I go in a grid style? Do I outline it and fill it in? Uh, there's all these decisions that I uh, realized had to be made at the time uh, before you can actually start doing the beading. And a lot of those are also made in the process of that beading. So when I was looking at it, there has to be an easier way. And because I'm fairly proficient with computer programming, I wrote a computer program that basically I would feed it the pattern that I would like. And I didn't have to worry about making all of those decisions. I could just sit down with my trays of beads and <laughs> and bead, right? And it just – it literally told me which color bead to pick up where and, and where it goes. It's a mindless, very meditative process from that point forward. How did the program you create change your artistic practice? It's changed my practice um, in a multitude of ways, mm -hmm. actually, because what I ended up doing originally with that first program was in the middle of the beating part of it. So I'd create the program. It produces a pattern. I take the pattern. I put it on my hide and I start beating. During that meditation process of the beating, I realized that the program I had written for it wasn't reflective of the actual process I do while beating. It's based on mathematical calculations, and it's very rigid in that respect. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the first big transition was going back and revisiting the computer program to produce the image as I would if I didn't have the computer program there. So I rewrote the program to do that for that particular type of pattern. It doesn't progress in the left to right, you know, the way an old dot matrix printer would right back and <laughs> forth. It does it in a connected fashion. So every subsequent bead that is placed within the graphical space of the screen is done in a way that would reflect how I would have put it together if I manually did it right. uh, myself. You eventually settled on a spiral. Yes. Why did you choose that pattern? The spiral for me is more representative of um, Indigenous knowledge building, um, where we think of life in terms of cycles. From that first bead, and I, 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 there's a lot of metaphors built into mm. um, my spiraled portraits in particular because to me the beads represent 
moments in our life or or a day in our life. And that bead is connected to the next bead because it's built on the previous knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that bead is connected to the next bead and the next bead. And so when you get to the end of your life, your entire portrait is created. That is the coolest thing I've heard today. (laughs) So describe these for me. Who are the portraits of? So my primary work... Uh, that came out of this was called Four Generations, and it was on exhibit at the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian. It was there for just over a year. Uh, and it was a series of portraits that started with my grandmother. So it would beat her portrait first, and then it would unbead her and beat my father, um, and then unbead him and bead me, and then undo me, and then beads my son, and then it's, it would cycle back around to the to my grandmother again. Mm-hmm. Now, as you mentioned, uh, you had this featured at the Smithsonian National Museum. Congratulations. That's Mm. amazing. Yes, thank you. Um, The portrait melds into one another through the eye. Why did you choose to do that? Um, It's a combination of belief systems. So my heritage is um, Cree and Soto, uh, Métis on my father's side and Ukrainian on my mother's side. And, you know, the belief systems that I was brought up with were – the, the eye is the gateway to the soul or you, that's where you see the true individual um, is through the eye. And th- there's something about the eyes and the sparkle in that eye. You know, when my son was born and my daughter was born and you looked into their eyes for the first time, there's that connection. And I think as humans, we naturally gravitate towards that. Even if we don't maintain eye contact, we always take that one little glimpse to see into the other person, to kind of get a sense of of who they are. Mm -hmm. Now, Indigenous art is is, is often still portrayed in a certain way in the past, separated from technology, and it's just this solitary little old ladies beating in a cabin somewhere. Do you think that that's changing? Absolutely. You know, uh, I'm I'm doing my PhD now uh, specifically on this idea, especially with technology, and the transformations of Indigenous people and how they utilize technology um, is completely different than the way the Western viewpoint is, Mm -hmm. Uh, especially in computer programming where you're working in a language that's very rigid and it has a certain syntax that needs to be followed. And so there's not a lot of leeway for creativity, Mm -hmm. so to speak. And yet I view the computer programming um, almost in a poetic sense. Um, and I'll find a way to manipulate, if I can, the the language to do what I I want it to do to be better reflective of my my physical steps that I would go through. But that's almost a colonial perspective where you're manipulating, you know, the underlying system rather than trying to work with it. You try you have to break the system in order to make it do what you want it to do because it wasn't designed to do that. Mm-hmm. And so my um, PhD studies are at that uh, transition between um, the culture and the computer. And can we use uh, cultural practices as instruments to teach the computer how to um, react to what we want them to do and to use our knowledge as Indigenous people to program the computer rather than being stuck into a constrained box of, you know, what the computer is expecting us to do. Right. So that's where I'm at right now is looking at computer language, not from a computer language perspective, but from an indigenous language perspective and the cultural components that go along with that. And the very first programmatic function I've created um, actually isn't one that is typically, we'll say, Western. So, uh, and it's the, um, the smudge ceremony. In our own practice, you know, when I smudge, I'm cleansing myself, I'm preparing myself, preparing my speech, my mind to make sure that I'm centered and focused and I have, you know, the blessings from the creator to make sure that I do it to the best of my ability. And uh, so I wrote a programmatic function because this is exactly what programs do at the start of their process before they even start doing what you've programmed it to do. The first things they need to do is clear out their memory registries, um, prepare the digital surface for, you know, for the the graphics that are going to come, clean out any buffers and all these technical components that go with it. It's a process that uh, usually when you start the program, you want to start it with a clean slate um, and have it prepared. 
right? And so that's the very first function of my computer language that I'm creating um, is literally called smudge. Um, so you would smudge the surface. And anytime you want to refresh or reset, um, say, a variable, you would just call uh, the smudging application or the smudging function to clean that up. That is so fascinating. <laughs> I could talk to you all day, but I got to stop now. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for speaking with me today. Yeah, you're welcome. John Corbett is an artist and professor at the University of British Columbia's Okanagan campus. To see his beaded portraits, visit our website, cbc.ca slash unreserved. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169 and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild, looking at how technology is informed by tradition on the show today. Still to come, we'll head to a classroom in Kamloops where students are bringing Indigenous tradition into the virtual world. It was really fun because I've never done anything like this. I've only like experienced virtual reality. Like with the goggles, I've never actually made one. Combining First Nations stories with 360-degree video. That's still ahead. While Indigenous content is being woven into more and more subjects in Canadian classrooms, many educators are trying to figure out how it works with math. But as the CBC's Chantelle Belrichard discovered, teachers in Prince Rupert are rising to the challenge. This counting song teaches young people how to count to ten in English and Somaliak, the language spoken by the Simshan people on the northwest coast of BC. Playing the ukulele you can hear is curriculum specialist Tanis Calder. She works for the Aboriginal Education Department of the Prince Rupert School District. Tina Demings is also a curriculum specialist in the district. A lot of teachers are wondering how they, they can use the culture mm-hmm. in teaching math. Demings and Calder led a workshop at a First Nations education conference in Vancouver last week, sharing their locally developed lesson plans and course materials with educators from across BC. And originally we started looking at it through a lens of weaving and uh, cedar weaving. Calder says the craft is a great way to teach younger children how to identify patterns. For older students, it can be used to teach more complex concepts, like algorithms. We've got an algorithm that is helping us make a rule that is also a repeating pattern, right? Sitting around tables with fake cedar strips, tape, and scissors, teachers have been working on following a pattern to weave a fish. It was a challenge at first for basket weaver and educator Heather Joseph. I had to take half of it apart and just restart again. (laughs) And it was like, oh, now I see the pattern. (laughs) Joseph has been teaching weaving at her school for years but never realized how much it could help with math. And it was like, oh my God, it was like blowing my mind. (laughs) Calders and Demings have been encouraging people to take their lessons back to their own schools with a caveat. It's also really important for them to look at how this can be created in their own community with their own stories. Thanks to the CBC's Chantel Belrichard for sharing that story. If you're interested in more information on any of the stories you've heard today, check out our website, cbc.ca slash unreserved. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169 and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild, examining the intersection between tradition and technology on the show today. Some young students in Kamloops are bringing Indigenous tradition into the virtual world. Students at Dallas Elementary are combining First Nations stories with 360-degree video. The CBC's Jennifer Norwell stopped by to see how it works. We would like to recognize that we are living on the Sequitmet territory and get to meet and listen to all different traditional people. We need to figure out which space you're going to be recording and then figuring out that you have all the pieces that you might need for this. I am Andrea Mangel and I'm a grade 6-7 teacher at Dallas Elementary. So we have been doing a deeper learning unit on the Sequitmet people. And so we have learned um, all about their past, we've analyzed their past, we've done some place-based learning at the Quayout Lodge and in our surrounding area. And then we looked at the impact of colonialism, and as an end idea, we came up with creating these oral stories to share with other students within our district to sort of understand 
the idea behind Truth and Reconciliation. So they've created a virtual field trip using 360 degree um, pictures that I took and they're adding their story kind of into those images that they've made. This is the tool that we use for um, viewing the virtual reality. What you're going to do is you are going to open it up and put in your cell phone or some kind of device that you have your that you can use to, to view images on. Then you fold it up and you close it up and it's got two eye holes right here for you to view through. And so that once they're done their tour, they'll be able to press play. They'll put the phone in, close it hold it up to their face and they will actually feel through the goggles like they are experiencing the tour. This is the only place in the entire world that uh, this equipment language and culture exists and you know it's on the verge of extinction and it's important to protect all of those different cultures and languages around our world. Um, you know we often hear things like um, you know, why will we also learn French? And it's like, yes, but French is also spoken in all these other different places. But this is the only place in the whole world where Sequetmic people have lived. Um, and the other reason is, is it's important to start bringing these issues to the conversation uh, for students if we're to make some social changes happen. I think that's important that they play a, a role in the idea of having... Um, truth and reconciliation a part of their learning at their level so that they're able to understand some of these concepts and go you know what that's an important thing that we need to do differently and we do have some responsibility as citizens to help move these issues forward. I'm Elizabeth DeVries I'm the technology coordinator in school district 73. Yeah so with your head in the goggles and your and the phone set up behind it with that specific tour loaded and ready to go you can take that and turn to the right and then to the right perhaps you would see a snowy hillside and then as you continue to turn around you would see the rest of that scene so you are immersed in that virtual reality. And what are the benefits of trying to use virtual reality in learning? It's a cheaper field trip, so you can take students all over the world using virtual reality to experience things. I've got classes that have experienced um, inside the human body based on looking at a virtual reality tour or have been in a surgery and watching that happen. So that is a, a great opportunity to take students where they can't feasibly go. In this specific case, um, we've got students who have created their own their own written work, so their own work in writing, and then they're taking that and building the visual and building the audio to come in and make it an experience where someone else can come and experience their story with pictures and the student's voice, and they don't have to be together at the same time. One of the things that they have done is they have taken traditional characters to convey those messages. So we have um, some different stories like um, how Raven made Day and Night... Um, we have um, a group over here that has looked at having a dispute between different animals. We have sky animals versus land animals. Like their creation, creativity level in, in coming up with these stories was pretty impressive. Hello, my name is Jameson. This is Cullen. Hello, and I'll be doing Deer and Pig. This is Kale. Hi, I'll be playing Bear. And this is Autumn. Hi, I'll be playing Kyle. And I will be playing beaver. Our story is about how Bear lost his tail. Let's get started. Hi, I'm Autumn Pickering and I'm in grade 6. It says this is a lake where it all happened. So this is where everything in our story happened at Shushwap Lake. So how did you come up with this story? I love the story. It's just kind of about how Bear and Coyote became friends and they kind of started fishing together and then Bear got his tail stuck in the ice and it ripped off. And that's how kind of bears don't have tails anymore. Well, it's been kind of hard to get how to do it. But after she showed us, it kind of, it got easier because then she shows us. And if we need help, we can just ask. And then she can help with us. Um, my name is Jameson Hicks and I'm in grade 7. It was really fun because I've never done anything like this. I've only like experienced virtual reality. Like with the goggles, I've never actually made one. Why was it important for you to tell this kind of story? Um, well, we actually heard this story in grade 4. So I thought it would be, and we kind of added our own details. So I thought it would be cool to pass it on. 
What do you think other students will think when they put on the virtual goggles and they get to hear your voice and your group's voice telling the story? I feel like it'll be really cool for them because, like, they haven't experienced it maybe with other kids or, like, other voices, and I think it'll be really fun for them. Okay, my name is Emerson Willis. Um, I'm in grade 7 in Miss Mangel's class. Well, we've been learning about the sequemic uh, things, and it's like we're, we're getting the chance to be able to explore, like, the sequemic region and stuff, I guess. We got a salmon here in, like, the Kamloops Lake and a 360 image that you get from Google Maps. This is the sockeye salmon we put together. It is made out of a sock that is painted the colors of salmon, glued onto a piece of wood with blue on the back to represent the salmon's journey. The opportunity to, to share the learning um, that this group has particularly had with understanding more about the Shukwetman history and the traditions of Shukwetman story is really exciting. And I think that um, it's something that we need to know as teachers, that it's, it's, it's a good way for us to learn and to have students move towards reconciliation in their own ways with learning and creating their own kind of product to say, this is what I've learned and this is pretty neat and I want to share that with you. All in all... I want to give you guys a huge three power claps because you've done a great job. So I'm going to give you three claps. Those were some of the students and teachers at Dallas Elementary School in Kamloops, B.C., talking to the CBC's Jennifer Norwell. Once they're finished, the plan is to share those virtual reality tours with other schools. So I have three beads, a black and a gold and a, another black one. I'm going to put it through the top and bottom, just like this, kind of close to the thread. And then I'm going to put my needle through that last bead, pointing up. That's my next guest in one of her online beading tutorials. Angela Gonzalez is at the Baskin, and she's using the internet to share her passion for beading. And I've reached her in Anchorage, Alaska. Angela, welcome. Hello, Zanazoon. Don't say. So tell me, how do you use the internet to teach others how to bead? For the past few years, I've been sharing like tutorial videos on my Facebook page through Athabascan Woman blog. I also write about beaders and beading and people's beading journey, among other things. Mostly, I would say the YouTube is one place that I share and people respond to that. And the Facebook videos are pretty popular, too. Mm. What are some of the ways that you teach and share beading tricks online? Sometimes people ask questions. I I mostly make beaded slippers or moccasins. Uh, in the interior, we call them slippers. But I know there's a, a lots of people in the lower 48 and probably around your region call them moccasins. So I've shared like how to make those uh, moccasins probably like maybe in the past five years. And it also it takes a lot. So from the beading, all the steps that that going through the beading process, but also like how to sew the fur on. I I try to teach beginners. And then so all the steps that it takes to uh, put the slippers together, I share that process. Why do you want to teach others how to bead? Because there's many people who do not get the opportunity to learn how to bead from their aunties or moms. There's people who are maybe adopted out at a young age. They appreciate learning more about their culture on the blog. and But also it just shows that they're disconnected. They don't, they, maybe their parents moved away. Like even with me, with my children, moving from the village now their whole life has been spent in the city of Anchorage. So they might not be as connected to their culture. So I, I think that's definitely why I um, like sharing it. And just with those from a distance, you could share through technology, reach more people uh, from far away. I teach online, but I also do beading classes. So lots of people tell me how much they appreciate learning. So for people like that, who don't always have the opportunity to learn. I want to give them that craft back because it's really connecting to who we are as Native people, connecting to our culture and connecting to our ancestors. And that's a strong gift, you know, to give someone. Mm -hmm. So you kind of created this cyber cyber circle of, of bead workers. What is it like? What is the beading community like online? 
I think it's really awesome. I love learning other people's techniques. One of the things I love about the Indigenous Beads Twitter account, um, hosting that you know a few times a year, is that I'm able to connect with lots of beaters. It seems like there's lots of beaters out of Canada um, that I appreciate mm-hmm. learning their techniques and just also hearing their stories, their beading journeys, like uh, what level they are, uh, what challenges they have, and I guess just the camaraderie. Wonderful. And that Twitter account is called at Indigenous Beads. Um, and your profile picture on the on the Twitter account shows you wearing a shirt that says, beading is medicine. How is beading medicine to you? Yeah, you know, in the past couple of years, I've really actually, I guess since 2016, so almost three years, I've really been going through, I would say, like this beating and healing journey. It's really connected me with my my grandma, I feel like, like when I'm doing something that she taught me or doing a pattern in the way that she did it, I feel connected to her. And there's so much strength in that. And also, when you give slippers, like I'll sell some slippers, but I also give like a lot to my family and friends. And when I give that to them, it feels like I'm receiving more just from their love because someone might have like one pair of beaded slippers in their lifetime. And that's such a special gift to give somebody, you know, and it just means so much to me. And so that, I guess, uh, giving and receiving way and, and also connection to our culture it means so much to me, and I just feel the power. And when you're beating, you're doing something, you know, positive, and the therapeutic nature of it could be, you know, doing something productive, doing something you love, and sharing that with other people, and just being able to go away into this place of, I guess, uh, beating bliss. Beating bliss. Awesome. (laughs) I like it. (laughs) Angela, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you so much for having me. I um, just love the connection of across the world of beaters. So thank you so much. Anabase. Angela Gonzalez is based in Anchorage, Alaska, and she runs the Athabascan Women blog. I want to take a second to tell you about what we're working on for next week on the show. We're going to be exploring Indigenous futurism, which is a movement in art, film, and literature that looks at Indigenous perspectives of the future. So there's no better time to talk about Indigenous people in space. Graduate student and writer Lou Cornham says the first time they saw an Indigenous character in space was in the 2012 film The Sixth World, which is about a group of Navajo space explorers setting up ancestral corn crops on Mars. Seeing that film was, yes, the first time I think I saw an Indigenous person in space that was like explicitly Indigenous and based on uh, like a real living Indigenous culture as opposed to something like Avatar, right, where they're obviously meant to be modeled on Indigenous people, but it's much more, you know, the romanticized image than anything drawn from a real practice of Indigeneity. Yeah. And so how did it make you feel to see an Indigenous person in space in an Indigenous story? I think it really answered a sort of loneliness that I'd had Mm -hmm. um, and thinking that I'd often sort of identified with the alien or the figure of the alien just because I was so interested in space, but also feeling alienated. Uh, So then seeing this film and knowing that there was some other Navajo person out there who was also thinking about traveling to Mars was like incredible to think that you weren't alone in having these kinds of visions or that this wasn't something that was uh, alien to being indigenous, Mm. that you could be from one place and still dream about traveling to another. That's a little sneak peek of what we're working on for next week as we take a deep dive into Indigenous futurism. 
That's it for this week's episode of Unreserved. We'll be back in this radio space next week for more community, culture, and conversation. This episode was produced by Stephanie Cram, Kyle Muzika, Zoe Tennant, and Anna Lazowski. I'm your favorite cousin, Rosanna Deerchild, coming at you from Winnipeg in Treaty 1 territory. Thank you for listening to Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. Mega say. For more CBC Podcasts, go to cbc.ca slash podcasts.